Hi and welcome. My name is Julianne Cost, and in this tutorial we're going to be talking all about how to convert images to black and white as well as add tonal overlays, edge effects, and film grain textures. Now I could begin by working directly on my image or I could create what's called a virtual copy. If I choose photo and then create virtual copy, watch what happens down in my film strip below. Previously I had one thumbnail that represented this photograph. Now I have two thumbnails. So I didn't actually duplicate the file on disk. I just told Lightroom to create a secondary preview so that I could perhaps turn this one to black and white, but I would still have my color image. So that if I wanted to post them both on the web or print them both out, I could do so side by side. So they're one image on disk, but Lightroom is going to treat them as if they are two separate sets of instructions for processing that file. Excellent. Let's go ahead and begin by converting this to grayscale. Now there are a lot of different ways you can do this. Probably the easiest is just by clicking the black and white option in the basic panel. That gives us a good starting point, but we might want to refine this a little bit. One of the ways you might want to try out some kind of different looks or refinements would be to go over to the preset area. Lightroom ships with a number of really cool presets and the nice thing is is that you'll notice that just by moving my cursor on top of them I'm actually getting a preview of what they would look like up above in the navigator panel. So I don't even have to go through and actually apply these. I can simply scroll through my presets to see what it is they would look like. Alright, well I actually liked kind of that black and white creative low contrast look. So I'm going to click on that. It still gave it a little bit more contrast than the default, but I'd really like to darken down the sky. So let's return back over to the right hand side and I'm going to click on the black and white panel. You can see this is kind of the automated mix. So we remember that the sky was blue and you know if we don't we can tap the Y key. The Y key will show us before and after and we can close this panel over here for a minute so we get a little bit larger of an area to view. And now I can see that this blue area here I want to darken. So you can actually click in either the before or the after image, click and drag down to darken down that sky. So now we've got this nice dark sky with these white puffy clouds. We also have this kind of yellowy orange color down here. Not quite sure which color it is. That's why I like the targeted adjustment tool because I don't have to go and guess which color range or which color sliders to change over here in the black and white panel. I can simply click on the grass in this case and drag down to darken it or drag up to lighten it. Since there's so much that's already light in this image, like all of the trees, I'm going to go ahead and bring the grass down a little bit and add a little contrast between it and the rocks. Excellent. Let's tap the Y key again. That'll get rid of the split screen there, the before and after. And now I want to add a little bit of a tone to this image. Or do I? You know, I'm not quite sure. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create another virtual copy. Because I like the state that the photograph's in right now, but I want to try some more things. So I go to Photo and then Create Virtual Copy. Now down in my film strip I have my original color image, my black and white image, but I'm working on this new virtual copy so that I can kind of explore new creative directions. Now we could use our presets over here and see if there's any toning that we like, but you know, let's actually go look at split toning and see how it works. There's two different ways that you can tone. You can tone your highlights or your shadows or a combination of both. If you were trying to emulate a traditional sepia tone look, then you would want to add your color in the shadow area. You can add saturation and then play around with adding or getting the right hue, but there's a keyboard shortcut. If you hold down the option key, you can then drag the hue slider and it basically previews the color that you're selecting at 100%. So you would pick the sepia color or whatever color you want, let go of the slider and let go of the option key, and then just dial in the amount that you want. If you were looking for a more antique look, then you would probably want to add color to your highlights because traditionally an antique image looks antique because the highlights have a yellow cast to them from aging, from the paper aging. And of course, if you do add 
color to both the shadow and the highlights, you can play with the balance slider here to determine where the two colors cross over. Now let's scoot down a little bit more under the effects area and I'm going to add a slight vignette. You'll notice when I move the amount in, I'm getting not a slight vignette at all, but a very, very harsh vignette. I'm going to change the style here from highlight priority to color priority and you can see it gets a lot softer. I'll also bring the midpoint in a little bit and get a little bit larger feather on that. In fact, I might even take down that amount even more. Well, excellent. Now you can see that I have my original color image plus my black and white version and now my sepia tone version. And again, these are all virtual copies, just sets of instructions that are all pointing to the same original file on disks so that you're not multiplying that image and having to handle multiple copies of it and, and taking up disk space. All right, let's say that I like this so much that I want to apply it to this image. Well, when I click on this secondary image, if I then click the previous button, it will apply that same effect. So now I've got a great starting point and all I need to do is customize the tonality in this image. So I'll go up to black and white, grab my targeted adjustment tool, and in this case because the tree trunks here are so bright, I'm actually going to make the grass a little bit darker by dragging down and then I'm going to click in the sky and drag up to make that a lot lighter. I think I went a little overboard on the grass down here, so let's click and drag that up just a little bit more. Just want to make sure we have that contrast in that image. But you can see how applying the previous settings really helped me get to this point much more quickly than had I started all over again. Now let's move to this next image here, and I'm going to use the adjustment brush to kind of help improve or finish the look of this. But first I need to crop it, so I'll tap the R key, and I want this crop square, so I'll select one to one, and then click and drag over my image so it's a little bit off-centered there, and then hit enter or return. All right, excellent. Now what I'd like to do is I would like to darken down the background area and take the color out of it. I also need to burn down this area a little bit, and I want to saturate and bring out a little bit of color in the flowers. So let's start, because these are all going to be selective adjustments, we'll start with the adjustment brush. First thing I want to do is darken down and desaturate the background. So let's decrease our, maybe our brightness a little bit, and desaturate. You'll notice that I have the auto mask feature on. If I don't, it's going to be difficult for me to make these changes to the background without the changes spilling over into the flower. So let's tap delete and delete that, and this time we'll turn on Auto Mask, and now watch what happens. When I click and drag, you can see that Auto Mask is not allowing the flowers to be affected as I drag this around, because what it's doing is, when it finds an edge, it's not able to cross over that edge. All right, excellent. Let's go ahead and fill the rest of this in. Now, I think this is a little bit heavy-handed, and there's some areas right in here that I also need to affect. And you could spend as much or as little time in there. But you know, honestly, I really don't actually want the wire to be colored either. So let's turn off Auto Mask and let's just go right over those wires and we'll darken them down a little bit as well. Obviously, we could go in with a smaller brush and really refine this. In fact, I need to fix these two petals right here. So watch what happens when I position my cursor over the pin. We can actually see the mask that we've created. It's overlaid in red. If I want that to be visible while I'm painting, I just tap the O key. Then instead of painting, I'm going to want to erase. So I can either click on the erase option here, or I can just hold down my option key or my alt key on Windows and simply remove this from the areas that it's spilled into. And I can just come around over here until I get exactly what it is that I'm after. All right, so I'm not going to waste a ton of time on this. Obviously, I could go in and be more accurate, but I think this is going to look just great. All right, so tap the O key again, 
and now we'll see our image. Whoops, a little overspray right over here. Let's just grab that and paint that away. Okay, now I also think that I've just done this way too extreme. So I'm going to bring back a little bit of the saturation from the background, and I'm also not going to take the background that dark. So I'm going to bring up my brightness a little bit. That's the great thing about these tools. Typically, I will apply them too dark to make sure that I'm getting the paint or I'm painting in the effect wherever it is that I want it to be, and then I'll just pull back on the effect. But I've noticed by putting it on really strong, it just allows me to see it a little bit better. Okay, now I want to add a second adjustment brush. So I'm going to click the new icon right here. And this one I'm going to load with just a little bit less brightness. So I want to reset my saturation slider. The easiest way to do that is just double click on saturation. And I don't really want the auto mask. What I want to do is I just simply want to dodge a little bit right here. And I'm going to take the flow down a little bit so that every time I paint, I'm just dodging a wee little bit. This way I can slowly build this up. So it's, it doesn't go on quite as strong, but eventually, you know, if you paint man, multiple strokes, it will appear. All right, so let's see what that looks like. See how I've taken down the brightness there? From there to there, excellent. So let's just take that down, maybe right to about there. Now I also mentioned that I wanted to increase the saturation here. And I'm not really sure if it's the saturation that I'm after, or maybe I want to add a little bit of color on my own. So again, I'm going to click on the New button right here and I'll reset the brightness by double clicking on it. And this time I'm going to actually add some color by clicking in the little swatch right here. And let's just add something really bright for now. We can always change it later. And I'll also add some clarity and some contrast to just give this a little bit of punch. And we'll click and draw. Now remember I put my flow way down so let's increase the flow right now so that we can do this kind of quickly. Now obviously this is way too much looks a little crazy right now. But that's okay. That's a variety of things happening, right? The contrast was up way too high, so let's knock that down a little bit. I think I'm going to like the clarity, but then the color is just way too much as well. So we'll just take that down a little bit until I'm just getting a little, little bit of pink. And obviously I could, you know, pick whatever color it is I want to pick, but I like the, kind of the pink color. Okay. All right, excellent. Click on the tool again to put it back. Actually, before we do that, let's see what it looks like here. At the bottom, we have a little preview for just our adjustment brush. So we can click that once. That's before and that's after. Now, what else do I want to do? Well, let's go down and revisit the effects panel. I want to add a vignette to this. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking it would have been really nice had I made the effect or the vignette from this image into a preset because then I could just reuse that. So let's do that. Let's click on this image right here, and I want that vignette. So what I'm going to do is, where it says Presets, I'm going to click the plus icon, and this will be a dark black vignette. And you can see that by default, it's going to be stored in my user presets, but I've also created these other folders. So if I wanted to save this in my vignette folder, I could. And what I want it to keep track of is the post crop vignette. I'll click create and we can see that has now been added to my other vignettes in my vignetting folder. So now when I return back to the hydrangea, if I want to apply that same dark black vignette, I can simply click on it. Well, it turns out it's a little bit too much for this one, but we can always back off on the amount and maybe increase the midpoint a bit. Excellent. One last thing I want to do is just add a little bit of grain, new feature to Lightroom 3, so I can increase the amount of grain. I can increase the size of the grain. This might be difficult for you to see unless I zoom in, but I don't want to zoom into 2 to 1. Zoom into 1 to 1 there. We can see there's the grain and there's the roughness, so we can get some really, really rough grain here. I think I want my size of my grain to be a little bit smaller and maybe the amount a little bit less. All right, and then we can see what that looks like before and after, just adding a little bit of grain there and then click again to zoom out.
Well, excellent. That should give you a good start into creating your own special effects and converting your images into black and white. I'm Julianne Cost. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.